Amen. We have with us this morning as our speaker, John Jenks. He was our couples retreat speaker for this week. He and his wife uh, were a great blessing to uh, the couples retreat. Many of you here were there this weekend, and I believe you can attest to that. It was a really uh, encouraging, edifying time. We're glad to have uh, his his uh, training and, and study focused on, on us this morning in our church, uh, and I trust it'll be an encouragement to us. He's the Association representative for the Wisconsin Association of Regular Baptist Churches, our, our sister organization to the north. He's also a vice president for Baptist Church Planners. Uh, you can check his more information about his ministries back there. But basically his ministry is to help churches keep being healthy churches um, and producing other churches, ideally, uh, and other Baptist Church Planners on down the road. And uh, it, we had the opportunity, deacons and pastors, to meet with John j just by ourselves last night uh, and to ask him questions, to get some of his wisdom uh, on, on our church, for him to give some feedback uh, where we're at as a church in this transition phase and, and our search process and what we're looking for in the future. Uh, we are greatly encouraged by, by his time spent with us, uh, his discipleship to us, basically. Uh, so I ask you to pray for us, the search committee, pastors and deacons, as we process and digest all that, he kind of opened up a, a fire hose on us and just let us have it. So we're going to take a couple of weeks to, to think through that and um, by God's grace, keep keep making wise steps as we go through this this phase. So pray for us in that. Uh, but for now, uh, enjoy the ministry of the word from, from John. Thanks, brother. Well, it is a privilege for Jennifer and I to be here with you this morning and uh, trust to be able to encourage you from God's word. Um, we do have a little display out there. It teaches you a little bit about BCP and how we can partner with you as a church uh, because we're partnering with the state fellowship that you are just such a key cog in. So, I mean, I have to start and say how much I appreciate the generosity of this church. I would transplant you to Wisconsin in a heartbeat. To have a church that would say, we care about families in our state, to provide opportunity for training and encouragement at a retreat, to let your pastors invest energy. There's always more work to do at home, and so to share them like you have, and, and many of you alongside that uh, couples retreat work, that is incredibly generous on your part. And God blesses churches that are generous. That's how it works, and you know that. I mean, that's why you've been doing this a long time. And you have been incredibly generous with our national association to let your right arm leave you or your head or however you describe your pastor. You don't have to tell me, but I would pick on him. If you say it the right way, I'd pick on him for you. You know, I'm part of the council, and so don't shoot me, okay? But um, we really appreciate your generosity, and that makes it hard on you right now. And that's why I told your deacons and pastors that I'm committed to pray for you every week until you have a senior pastor. And I only give that commitment to about one or two churches a year, tops, because that's a commitment and it takes work uh, to stay in touch and to pray and to be alongside of you. But you have been generous. I'm going to ask, I have about five or six really key men who pray for specific things that others don't because it's not their business. But um, these men know how to bring it to the Lord and I'm going to ask them to be a part of that with me. Uh, for you. Um, I, we appreciate you and your generosity, and I know God has good planned in the transition and in the struggles of that. Let's not lie. It's hard at times, and uh, you have to buckle down. You have to remember that you're a part of each other, even if you are the armpit part of the body, right? <laughs> I always suggest that's probably me, because I stinketh quite often, right? But, um, but working together, and I'd rather be the armpit than the mouth that my wife says I am, so... Um, anyway, uh, that's, that we each have our role in the body. We need to do it together. And it's a great time to focus on that and to help one another. And I know that's how you're being led. It's good. I want to share maybe just a couple of things about our ministry. Not much because I'd rather preach the Word of God. Uh, but BCP is a mission agency, which means we are very extra and unimportant. What matters is the local church. And so our job as a mission agency, because we're not written in the pages of Scripture, if we're going to do something, we need to help facilitate and encourage the local church. God makes his decisions through the local church. Missionaries are sent from local church, not mission agencies. People go into ministry full-time from the local church. Um, matter of fact, we don't even claim missionaries as a mission agency. We say, we are helping these churches send these people. 
Um, so we, our role is to the sending church and walking alongside of you. And if we can be a help, that's our plan as it relates to church planning in the United States and revitalization works in the United States. With that in mind, our circle of churches, and you can decide what that is, but generally that circle has had some shrinkage in the culture of America. We're smaller. And if churches aren't healthy, no missionaries get sent. You know, Baptist Mid-Mission had a year, a couple years ago, they had one missionary. I mean, can you believe that? One new missionary? Baptist Mid, I mean, that's a big, that's a, that's a big organization. And our agency went a couple of years without any new missionaries. And, uh, and part of that is the pond is shrinking. Our churches were, were, were struggling some. And so that's why BCP came to me and asked, and we went before the Lord with our church and our deacons, and they gave us the boot in a loving way and said, go and help churches be strengthened. And so my role at BCP is just to help mother churches like you and to facilitate primarily making disciples and building leaders. Because out of that, that's how churches are planted uh, because that's how you're going to plant a church and, and rescue a church in your future because that's just a natural part of church life if we're producing disciples and making leaders. And so my role is just to encourage churches like you. I mean, that's why I'm standing here today um, because BCP says, go do that. Um, wherever God would take you. And I love that kind of freedom. What, how do we do that? We come alongside of people like you and help you reconcile people to God. I mean, that's your job, right? Meet people, reconcile them to God, 2 Corinthians 5. And as you do that, then you're going to want to disciple them intentionally. We don't want to just hope that, well, they came to know Jesus and we hope somehow, some way, they show up mature in Jesus over here. I mean, we, we should hope that, but we should do something intentionally as churches to cause that. And so we're trying to stir that up in churches so that, again, churches would plant and revitalize. So our church in the middle of Wisconsin took on a goal in the year 2000 to send 100 people into ministry in the next 100 years. And you say, you're not going to live that long. And I say, I hope not. You know, um, I, I hope that we would instill right biblical mission that would go on long after us. Amen. Don't you want this church vibrant after you're in heaven um, or until the rapture at least. Right. And uh, so plant revitalize churches, send people And our church so far. Jennifer and I were the 25th and 26 people sent out from our church since the year 2000. And the way that happens is to train people at home because you got to have a core that stay that are on task and then have overflow so that more could go plant and revitalize churches both in the United States and beyond. And BCP wants to help you train people to go to the uttermost part of the world. We don't care that they stay in North America. We just want you doing God's commission the way you want, the way you're supposed to. So there's two parts specifically that I'm responsible for. And I do this in churches that are almost dead. Okay, there are churches in our state here in Iowa that are almost dead, right? They're just shriveling up. And so we're actually BCP this April. I'm going to be the primary speaker at the state conference, and BCP is launching a kind of joint initiative with your state fellowship to help revitalize churches. And it came out of the last number of years when I was a pastor, because I've been doing what I'm doing now. It'll be two years in March, so we're just at the front end. But as a pastor, I began to, 20 years ago, uh, using retreat. And then about 30 weeks of uh, uh, regular training, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three at church. For 20 years, we did that. And then the last four years began to help other churches do that. Pastor and three men would come, do a renewal retreat, and then by way of Skype or online training for 24 weeks, um, we work with that group for that, that segment of a year. And then they split in two and have two groups that start and train leaders within their church. That's the goal of that. And there's really um, three stages to it. So first, they're being trained. And they begin to lay out the plans of how to be intentional in discipleship in their church. They train their own people that second year. And if a church and pastor, they agree that they should want other help, we have an older lady who comes alongside of some ladies in the church and does a similar training that fits how a woman leads in their part of church uh, ministry and discipleship. And then out of that, our goal would be for those churches to train other churches. And so this began four years ago. And so the church in Ames, Crossroad Baptist Church, the church in Creston, uh, the church in Ank Ankeny Baptist Church, all three of them are now training other churches 
in the state and walking them through how to intentionally disciple. And Creston's just about ready to start that. It looks like they're going to come alongside of Corning as one of the two new revitalizations of helping a smaller church that has gotten feeble to help them kind of re- relaunch and, uh, and do discipleship. And it's not a hurry up, everything's fixed in 30 minutes. You know, it's a 10-year process. Um, this is not for the faint of heart or the weary, right? I mean, change and growth has to come from God. And it comes by slowly discipling and training people with intentionality. So that's what we're doing to try and come alongside of churches. Today what I want to do is stir that up at the individual level. And out of God's word, not out of my words, hopefully. You see it there. So go to Titus chapter 2. We read kind of the outflow of this in the, in the service already. We read and sang about the power of God to do this in the service already. So you should be absolutely primed. But in case you're not... Um, I always pick a passage when I come in to speak where, you know, I don't have a lot of authority here this morning. I'm a guest speaker. I'm a nobody. Your pastors are the leaders here, okay? But they've given me a moment, so I'm going to depend on Scripture. Pick a passage that tells me I'm allowed to spit this out, okay? So look at verse 1. It says, but as for you, and he's talking to Titus, who's on the island of Crete, which is way worse than Mount Pleasant. I mean, I, I actually accidentally told my wife... I said, went downtown, and it's such a pleasant downtown. (laughs) I started laughing to myself, like, well, it should be. It's Mount Pleasant, you know, but I didn't see the mountain yet. But anyway, um, I'm just kind of working on that a little bit, uh, being from out east. I've seen a mountain or two. But um, so I, I said, you know, Mount Pleasant can't be nearly as bad as Crete. I mean, the sign to their island was lazy liars. I mean, that's the byline. Crete, home of lazy liars. Mount Pleasant's not that bad, is it? (laughs) <laughs> They're laughing. You're not sure. Like, well, you know, <laughs> your Iowa farm-based, hardworking, not real emotional. I mean, you've already been like a little more emotional than my church. You know, my, I always say my church is kind of Scandahoovian. And uh, so their idea of expression is, you know, this is clapping. I mean, that means they're all in. I mean, so you guys are great this morning. Your 8 o'clock service was really good, actually, this morning. It was kind of fun. Um, it gets me wound up. But anyway, Crete is a tough place. And if Paul could look at Titus and say, you need to teach these things and instill it in Crete, it can't be nearly as bad in Mount Pleasant. But these things still need to happen. And he says, but as for you, and, and really, he's saying it to Titus, but as you walk through this passage, at certain points, you're going to go, is he still talking to Titus or is he talking to me? And you should feel that way in a passage. God, by inspiration, changes pronouns in this passage back and forth a little bit so that you're, you kind of get wound up in it. And that's the point of the passage. You are supposed to own pretty much everything that's here as an individual. And so he says, but as for you, teach or spit out what accords with sound doctrine. Now go down to verse 15 because you have the same word as teach, but it's now translated in most of our versions, declare. And teach, declare, it's not the normal word for doctrine. It's a word that literally means spit it out. And so this passage is hemmed in by these two ideas that we need to spit out these things. So I'm going to spit it out this morning, but in actuality, you should take it in so you can spit out these same things. And further, it doesn't just say in verse 15 to Titus or to me this morning, spit these things out. But then it gets a little stronger and it uses the word exhort, which means I should look at you in the eye and say, you most definitely need to do this. This is not an optional passage. So I spit it out and I'm kind of a little tough on you this morning. That's why I picked this because it fits me. I like to be straight ahead. It gets worse because the next word is not just exhort, but what's the next word? Yeah, rebuke, which means if you look at me and go, I don't know. I say, if you're not doing this, you are wrong. That's a little tough, isn't it? And then he says further, he says, don't just, uh, you know, exhort and rebuke, but he says, do it with how much authority? Whoa! I mean, I'm standing on solid ground when I tell you this stuff this morning, is what I'm saying. I mean, I have all authority. It reminds you of Matthew 28, another discipleship passage where it says, all authority has been given unto you, right? It has the same kind of ring, same words. And so what he's saying is, from Christ to you, this is what we must do. No more playing church. No more halfway. No more waiting for a pastor to make a program to do this, okay? It's not in the Bible. The Bible just flat says... We need to do the stuff that I'm about to spit out. All of us. I don't care how old, and I don't care how young. 
Your five-year-old is in this service, six years old. This passage has you in it. You're going to find it in just a minute. Male or female, it's in the passage. He says, so with all authority. And then even further, this verse, I mean, if you don't think this matters, it ends by saying what? Let no one disregard you. Now, I give this same intro. I mean, this might be Sermon 50. My poor wife, that's why she skipped first service. She's heard this a couple times. Maybe she should come and teach it. I don't know. Um, she could. <laughs> it says, let no one disregard you. I preach this in a, in a nice, happy church in Iowa that will remain nameless. And this little old lady came up to me after the service and said, I can't do this. Well, I'm traveling. I don't really know who's in charge at a church. But apparently she's the matriarch because... I didn't know this. And, and so I looked at her and said, I'm sorry, but did you not hear the introduction? I have to tell you at this moment that you are wrong. And I saw the 30-year-old pastor in the corner going, oh, no. Because <laughs> apparently she gave the land for the church a long time ago, or her family did. I don't know. It doesn't matter. She's still wrong. Okay? And, and I said, you're wrong. I said, she goes, well, I just became a widow six months ago. I said, even better. You don't have a husband to take care of. You can focus I'm doing what's in this passage, and you understand a whole nother level of life that you can bring to the young, because that's what this passage is about. And I walked away. Well, she walked away. <laughs> That'd be the truth. <laughs> the cool part of that story is that was about a year and a half ago, and uh, about, I don't know, several months ago, I bumped into the assistant pastor from that church, and he told me, he said, you know that lady? I said, yeah, I've been using her as an example. He said, well, here's the rest of the story. She's now doing the passage. Isn't that cool? I just love that. Um, and it's not because of me, obviously. She was done with it when she walked out on me. But the Spirit of God uses the Word of God, right? And we cannot deny it. So just don't deny it right out of the gate. It'll be easier for you. Okay, don't disregard this. Don't say, wow. Um, just drink the passage in. Let me spit it at you. And uh, let's put it to you. So go back to verse 1. Teach. And I think this passage is to all of us when you think about it. Oh, man, I almost forgot. i got to give you a way to look at this sermon. So when you're doing a sermon, in order to get it right, you need to look at what's in front of you and what's behind you. Or literally who. Who is in front of you and who is behind you. Now, some of you are really intelligent and older. And you've already figured this out. And you're like, look. I'm so old, there is nobody in front of me, okay? And you know who you are in this service, okay? And you're kind of telling the truth, okay? And I'm, by most people's consideration, I'm getting there, okay? I hate to admit it, but young people just think I'm old, and it's true, okay? So some of us, we start to get to this end of the spectrum. We're like, there's nobody else. Well, the, then you have the most optimal opportunity because everyone is behind you, and they need you. Old people in church, my wife tells me I'm not allowed to call you old, but it's in the passage, sorry. Old people are really important in church, okay? And, and if you're out in this front area, bind together, encourage one another, help one another, and get after what's behind you, and there's a lot of it. But if you're here, which most of us have a level of those who are in front of us, I still have my dad I'm thankful that I'm going to who's older than me, that's wiser than me, right? Um, I don't have my grandfather anymore, bummer, but I have my dad. And I have some older pastors that I go to for advice in my life and some old dudes at church that I trust who straighten me out from time to time because I need that, right? And then there's people behind me. I got a guy, Sam, who came to know Jesus last June through the witness of our daughter and some situations at church and God rescued him him from almost taking his life and now he's been through the stranger on the road to Emmaus and he is he's on task and he may even be headed to Cedarville in the fall uh, for a Bible major can you believe that I mean God has just lit him up and it's so fun, and I just love that. I have another young man who's married an RN and uh, working hard, almost lost his whole family to alcohol because he, even though he's been through a Bible college, he's got, he got sucked into that, and now I'm working with him, and he's been free for a while, and I'm discipling him, because I don't just disciple leaders. I have to do this passage just like you. Who's in front of me? Who's behind me? And I want you to be thinking that as you go through the passage. In this uh, photo, you have my friend Ryan Zawicki on one end, 
And uh, as he got developed and I was discipling him, we threw him into youth Sunday school room and then locked the door. And we let him out about 10 years later. And uh, during that time, he was teaching a a young man named Zach. And Zach is kind of runs to his own beat of a drum, a really smart guy. Uh, We sent him off to Bible college and they almost got kicked out for making a blowgun and, and like killing fish in the school pond. I mean, he's just a creative Wisconsin kid. They just don't understand them out there, you know. But anyway, he's, he's just, he's got a lot of go to him, all right? I'll never forget though, Ryan, when he's preaching Zach's installation service at our church. He says, I'm, I'm so thankful that I got to teach Pastor Zach, and he said, I have such confidence to be able to call him my pastor today. Isn't that cool? I get goosebumps telling the story. And now, Zach is reaching backwards to Gabe, Ryan's son. Right? And this is God's plan. I just give you a visual so you can see how this works. But our church wasn't always this way. When I was 25 years old and I was an assistant pastor at our church, Um, I had like five young ladies that wanted discipleship. I went to the five oldest, wisest women in church, asked them if they would disciple these young ladies, and all five of those older ladies told me no. Said, what would I say, pastor? I don't know what to do. I'm like, you know what to say? I've heard you pray like this. I gave examples. I mean, I knew these were godly women. They're like, I can't do it, pastor. Nope, 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 nope. And I don't cry very often, but I went home and cried. I'm like, God, what am I supposed to do? I mean, I cannot disciple these young ladies. That is not appropriate. And I mean, we're just young. I mean, God, this is your plan. It's in Titus. One of the ladies, Mrs. Patel, came back to me a couple weeks later. She had been a widow for quite a while. She was about 60-something at the time, had just retired from teaching in the public school for a, a long time. And she looked at me. She goes, I'll do it. I don't really know how. It'll probably be terrible but I'll obey, you're my pastor, and it is in the Bible. I'm like, okay, I can work with this. And you have to know Mrs. Pato, she's just kind of straight ahead lady, and she still is. You know, I mean, I remember our, our kid, our first son, you know, your firstborn, two years old, and I put him into the two-year-old class that Mrs. Pato was running with another lady, it's like 20 little urchins running around in there, put him over that little half door, which they only have at churches, I don't know where they get them from, but I, I set him down over that door, you know, and the biggest three-year-old comes up to him and shoves him right on his backside, and I'm in charge of this room as pastor, and I'm like, what just happened? And before I knew it, my son got up and punched the kid right in the solar plexus and dropped him, which I was kind of proud of. But I was pretty sure I was wrong, okay? And I didn't know what to do. And Mrs. Patel knew I had no clue at 20-whatever years old. And she looked at me and she goes, Pastor, I think that needed to happen. You run along. I said, yes, ma'am. And I just left, you know. I mean, like, you just need a Mrs. Patel, right? I mean, she's just this godly older woman who knows what's going on, okay? And that's what this passage is about, is a lady like that. And I'll tell you, hopefully before the end, the rest of the story with Mrs. Padel and our kids, because she is this woman. She comes to church now, I mean, broken back. She shuffled in a couple of Januarys ago. It's like minus five out. She hadn't been in church in six months because she'd been in a wheelchair in her home. She shuffles into church, gets in the back pew. All these young women are crowded around her, asking her for advice. She doesn't have a ministry at church. She just has a ministry. All she has to do is show up, because this is who she's been now for 20 years, right? And she shuffles in. I'm like, Mrs. Pato, what are you doing at church? It's Sunday. You're right, Mrs. Pato. What was I thinking? You know, I'm always wrong. (laughs) I'm like, just a little off, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like, you got to learn from our older people. They know what's up. So what, what are we supposed to do? Let's, let's spit it out here. i got to get moving. Uh, the who. Well, the first verse would tell us, teach what accords with sound doctrine. And it seems like the way it's written, it's to Titus, but it's also to all of us. So every one of us, before we're done, young and old, male and female, are going to be told to teach or spit out sound doctrine in one way or another. And what is sound doctrine? Sound, I always picture my German short hair, Blitzkrieg. He's three years old. If he came in this room, he would definitely vault onto the stage. He would have muscles bulging out. His ribs would be hanging out. I mean, he is a sound representation of a German short hair pointer. Matter of fact, as my friends say, all that running gear just to carry that nose. I mean, that's, that's what it is, okay? And, and I, I mean, he hunts. He's just acrobatic, crazy, okay? 
I mean, he has jumped, I told him at the retreat, he jumped over a couch with a missionary on it in our house one day because someone startled him. I mean, he is Michael Jordan of dogs, okay? He is sound specimen. You know, because you don't want a short hair that has all that muscle and no nose. That'd be terrible. Or no back end, you know, if the back legs were wimpy and you got this great nose, the dog will never get through the brush. What's going on? No, sound means all the pieces fit together. And it says in this verse that you need to teach with sound doctrine. And that's the traditional word for teaching in the New Testament. You need to give this instruction and it needs to be sound. It needs to all fit together. It can't be hobby horsed on just the nose or just the back end. People need to be able to walk in off the street and you be able to tie it together so they know why their life has been disrupted and disaster and how it fits in scripture and how there's hope. It needs to be put together in that way. And that takes a lot of work. We can't just be on our hobby horses and we need to understand thoroughly old men says older men in verse two are to be sober minded that means serious and i like to laugh it's pretty obvious but i'm serious i'm really serious about my walk with god and what we're supposed to be getting done and at my church more than once actually on a regular basis someone would come to me and say pastor you're just too doggone serious and unbeknownst to them i go in my office and go yes I'm almost getting this passage right, right? I'm serious. I'm sober-minded. We're in a war. This is not flim-flam church. This is not something added into our life. This is who we are, sober-minded and dignified. Dignified is the, the same root word as the word that's used to translate godly. And what it means is that you direct people's attention to God. That's what it is to be dignified. And so... You know, I had this happen. We were first married. I was having some trouble with my in-laws. I called the pastor that married us. I'm like, Pastor Jones. And I'm like in a New York state of mind talking a mile a minute. And finally I took a breath. And Pastor Jones just carefully said, John, I'm a seminarian at the time. but Have you talked to God about this? Well, um, can I call you back? <laughs> It's not funny, right? But I mean, like the guy had three words out and he already had me, right? Because he's old and mature. And he knew what was, a matter, what was most important was to connect me to God in my situation. Because out of that, everything else that's going to need to be instructed on my next phone call could actually reside in my heart correctly, right? He's dignified. Pastor Jones, that. We need to also, old men, be self-controlled. Um, That doesn't mean we can't be passionate, but those passions need to be brought within the framework of how God wants us to live. So I think we should be passionate, not boring. Okay, when I hunt, I'm all in. You know, I'm in mud up to my waist in my waders. It smells terrible, and I'm like, yeah. You know, I'm all in. I'm passionate because I got young guys behind me, and I'm carrying the most because I'm going to show them what it is to be a a man and how you do this, and then I'm going to talk to them about God in the duck blind. It's awesome, right? I can be passionate, but it's got to be built around God's kingdom and what he wants in our life. Old men are be self-controlled. We need to be sound. That's that Blitzkrieg word again, okay? Balanced, everything fitting together. Sound in our faith. Now, as an older person, I can be sound in my pattern. Have you been there? I go to church. It's Sunday. I have devotions. It's morning. I go to work, it's time, right? I have a good pattern, but a pattern isn't necessarily faith. And young people look at us and go, I could never be like that because they're looking at our pattern. What they need to see is sound faith. They need to know how we are living out what we actually believe. They've got to see how we're connected to God and that's why this pattern is showing up and that we're not just patterned and doing church got to be we got to be ready they they need to see how it all fits together in us sound in our faith sound also not just in faith but in love Um, as our church is reaching people from our community we have a a young man that came for a a while uh, he's a cross dresser 17 years old couldn't figure out if he was a boy or a girl because he doesn't have his identity in christ and so everything's up for grads and, and hard to understand, right? He'd walk in like that, and that that's just stands out a little bit in our church. And our older people, I love them. They just hugged on him and talked to him, and they talked to him about Christ, not about what he's wearing, because their love was sound. They knew the most important thing for that young man was to know Jesus Christ. And they had a sound love, and they've shown that in so many ways. And I learned from them how to have sound love. 
sound, also in steadfastness. Every generation, and there, I met someone, 93, I think I heard, I'm telling you, here this morning, that's definitely on this side of the page, okay? Every one of us, when we get older, we look back and go, that generation is wussy, okay? I mean, we just don't think they have steadfast. They're just not rugged. What's wrong with them? And you know what? It's true because you see that as you grow. We don't ever start with that, right? I've been reading for several years now Winston Churchill's six volumes of World War II. I am finally in the last volume. They're long, technical. But in volume four, um, he is meeting with FDR for the first time. It's before the U.S. is in the war. And they meet in Newfoundland. They both sail in, and Winston Churchill sails in on the Prince of Wales. I mean, a brand new, I mean, the most majestic battleship in the world at the moment. And they meet there, and the meetings go long, so it turns into a Sunday. So they decide to have church on the bridge of the Prince of Wales. And so most of the officers from the cruiser that FDR came on and the officers of the Prince of Wales met. You can't even picture this happening today, unfortunately. And Winston Churchill picked out, oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. He picked that hymn and some scripture to be read. FDR, who they called the evangelist, by the way, because of how he shared the truth of Jesus Christ over and over with Stalin. You should read some of that. It's kind of interesting. And I don't even think he was even a believer. Um, but anyway, neither one of them believers, but they met on this bridge. And the men worship together. And the part that caught me in the book was that FDR, or excuse me, that Winston Churchill says, and to think, six months later, half the officers in this meeting were dead. Because the Prince of Wales was sunk in the Asian conflict. And almost every officer died. How, I mean, that was just one incident. Winston Churchill can write line after line like that from the stuff that he went through. I mean, talk about a man who was steadfast and he didn't have the spirit of God in him. And I look at that and I'm like, I need a steadfastness that it should eclipse that by miles if I stand with Jesus Christ, amen? And so I, I'm still trying to get to that older man's steadfastness because something happens at church, you know, you're in a transition like this and I'm just, I can be like that person by every storm, I still can get there. How about you? Well, you don't have to admit it, but it happens. And we need to be steadfast. Look to your older people to be steadfast because they're supposed to be sound in it, unmoving. And I've had example of that in my life over and over. Now, I hate to be rude and sneak up on you ladies, but in verse three, it says older women likewise. And the language would mean everything you just heard of, that the men were supposed to be, you need to be. I know that wasn't very fair because you thought that was their assignment. But the ladies have all of that assignment, and your assignment's even longer. And the lady said, it always is, <laughs> right? <laughs> My wife's list is always longer than mine. <laughs> There's no doubt. And that is, did kind of make me scratch my head and go, why is the ladies' list longer? I mean, certainly they need to be dignified and sober-minded. They need to cause all those same things. So it makes sense that he says, likewise, ladies do that. But their list is longer because I think your position is more difficult. And it's difficult in this way. You have to submit in every area of your life, pretty much, unless you're a boss somewhere. Um, you pretty much have to submit everywhere. You have to go to church, and men have been given by God the responsibility to lead at church, and you have to submit. And that's awesome and easy until they're idiots. I shouldn't say that in church. Until they don't do biblical things. And then it gets really tricky, doesn't it? The same at home. You're supposed to submit to your husband, which is great when he's on task with Jesus, but when he's not, that's one of the hardest assignments there is. How do I do right in the middle of this mess? And as men, we're always a mess at some point, right? I mean, we're never flawless the whole way. It just doesn't happen. So the ladies have a tougher assignment. I think that's why this is here. You can, that's my interpretation. Okay, you can look at what's said next, you decide, because um, it, it doesn't say it outright. Older women, all those things you're supposed to do, but then also be reverent in behavior, not complaining, uh, not saying, God, why'd you put me in this mess of a church, a home, a whatnot? No, reverent, God, I'm with you here. What do you want next? Reverent, not slanders. Not looking at the other ladies going, if these men would get their head in gear, this would be fine. 
That's slander, okay? We don't say that. Can't say it. It's wrong. It may be true that they need to get something in gear, but, but we don't slander, right? He says, not a slave to much wine. Now, again, I'm going to walk out where I know nothing about, but I'm telling you, I watched my wife have three children, and I think that is the most amazing thing, and I don't know how a body ever recovers, and all the ladies say, it doesn't entirely, right? And wine was used a lot medicinally when everything was aching and paining, and ladies, as they age, they have the effects of the hardships of being a woman. Let's tell the truth. In a way, sometimes that men don't experience. And they also usually had access to the reserves, right, the pantry. And he says, do not cover your hardship with alcohol. And we, today we do it with fancy medicine sometimes in a way that we just become brainless, not just women, but men do the same thing. And, and it's not healthy. Some of our pain we, we really are going to have to endure. Medicine's not wrong, but he says, do not let it be something that enslaves you. He says, they are rather to teach, that's that word doctrine, teach what is good. Um, good means beautiful. Uh, don't you love it that the beauty word is associated with the ladies? And in just a minute, you're going to find out the young men are supposed to do the same thing. And I think it's because they learn it from the older ladies. Um, teach. Women are supposed to teach in church. There's places for that, and this passage would teach us very clearly that it's going to be to young women and to young men. I think the young men, because it says likewise in the front of their verse, so I'm going to talk about young men next, even though it's out of order, and go to verse 6, says likewise, urge the young men. Certainly the older men are supposed to do that, but the ladies are supposed to as well. Mrs. Padel is an example of that. I told you about her. So she's a widow the whole time I've known her, and Always right near the week of our anniversary, she would call us and say, I'm taking you and your children to lunch. Because you can't argue with an older lady. I mean, if she tells you she's doing that, she's doing it. And uh, I was always embarrassed, though. I'm like, Mrs. Pato, you're a widow. I, I feel weird about you taking me to lunch. She goes, I have more money than you, Pastor. I know what you make. You know, <laughs> like, again, okay, we're going to lunch. You know, I mean, <laughs> and we would go to lunch. She's a great lady. And we're going to lunch. And uh, she would talk to Jen and I a little bit, but she mostly just talked to our children. That's why we were there. And she would interview them about their year, what they were learning, what Jesus was doing in their life. And, that, you know, it just became this, they just loved her. It was a comfortable relationship. And this happened from the time they were a little, all the way up through teenage years, this yammering's taking place. So cool. And uh, so when Joshua, our middle child, went to go to college, um, Mrs. Padel was housebound at the time. And so I went to her and I said, Mrs. Padel, um, what are the top five things that I should tell Joshua as it relates to how to do well at college? And she's like, okay, this is what it is. And she's in her 80s, but she's so sharp. She's just like, and I'm like, slow down. I got my, you know, tablet out and I'm typing this stuff down. I put it all in so I'd remember. She gives me five things. If I'd said 10, she'd have gotten 10. You know, I, I just, whatever. She just nailed it. Boom, 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 boom. Spiritual, educational, the whole nine yards was there. So we're driving to college, you get about halfway there. I said, Josh, by the way, I said, I interviewed Mrs. Padel the other day to ask her what are the top five things you need for college. So this is what she said. And he goes, stop. And he pulls out his tablet. I had trouble telling him. And he types down what Mrs. Padel had to say. Because she was an older woman who understood who was behind her, Right? have been cultivating that. And he's ready to listen. Not because he's that wise, but because he'd been having shape in his life for a while, right, from someone older like her. Urge the young men to be self-controlled, it says. Not shocking, because the man is supposed to be self-controlled, and the woman likewise, right? So the older people are to be bringing it into order. Young men, you need to do that. And it's not natural, Naturally, I get technical fouls, seven of them my senior year of high school, okay? I was out of control and needed to be benched permanently, okay? Um, it, it, we need older people to self-control us, help us. He says, young men, show yourself, verse 7, in all respects to be a model of good works. How do you learn that? From the good teaching of the older woman and from older men who teach sound doctrine. You need to have good works, beautiful works. You need to be the first ones at church, young men, to jump up and work. You need to be the men at home. Be the young men at home that jump up and do your job. 
That's what God has asked you to do. And it's part, it's part of development as a young man. Um, you need to show in your teaching, young men. So young men are to teach doctrine. And you show integrity, which means if you're going to teach it with your mouth, you need to live it. If you can't quite live it, be careful what you're teaching. Okay, make sure your life and your words match. And then he says, also show this in your dignity, young men. You're supposed to be young men who direct other young men to God when they're with you. Um, and you might be alone in this. I felt alone in this for years. I would be the guy that was bringing up God with my friends. My kids, my young men have felt alone in this. Very seldom are other young men being like this, but you need to do it, even if you're the only one, because your young friends need God, and they need to have their attention on God. And it doesn't matter if you're at a public school or you're at church, it doesn't matter where you are, you need to direct them that way. That's what young men are supposed to be developing. And then he says in verse 8, and have sound speech. That means short hair speech, right? German short hair speech. It need, your speech needs to fit together. You can't talk this way on the ball diamond and this way at church. It needs to all fit together how you speak. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. And he says then, he said, if you do that, there's a that. That's the cool part about being young in this passage. If you do these things, there's an outflow to it. It says, so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say. I like that. I love that outcome. What does that look like? So our boys, we weren't going to pay college for them in total or much. They were going to earn it in my mind. And so we start, helped them when they were 12 and 14 to start mowing yards. Pretty soon they're doing it on their own. And their accounts are growing and they're shoveling snow. And I'm, I'm really a minimalist. So they had push mowers and shovels. Then they got some snow blowers. Um, and so that's how they worked. And uh, eventually, the last year and a half, they had the business. They finally had a zero turn mower. I mean, they thought, we finally get to ride, right? And so they're doing that. Well, one of the early yards they were doing is owned by a lady who has a little fish with feet on it on the back of her car. She's not really into Jesus, we would say. And, uh, and they turned a little close and cracked her fence. And she called me immediately. Your boys broke my fence. And I'm like, well, they have a new mower. They don't realize maybe how wide out the back it is. It could have happened on accident. Did, did they know they broke it? Yes. Did they tell you? Yes. Did they tell you we would repair it for free? Yes. And I'm thinking, then why are you calling me? <laughs> you know? So that's what I said. I said, so why are you calling me? Because I don't understand why they would be honest. And I said, let me tell you why. And in two or three sentences, I gave her who Jesus Christ was and why these boys would act that way. And she goes, well, that makes sense. I'll pay for it if you'll put it up. Okay, click, you know. Do you hear that? I mean, a lady who believes in evolution thought Christ made sense in that context, right? His word could not be condemned. That's what the passage says. It's still true. You understand that? Young men, you can dent your community this way. Um, young women, look at verse 4. And uh, the ladies, older ladies, and it says, and so older ladies train, and the word is literally self-control. That's what the word train there means. It's a repetition of self-control. And I always picture my wife with our daughter when she was like 13 and kind of wound up. And my wife would have to take her shoulders softly and say, Abigail, be quiet. Stop. Right? Because she's like, ah! And she self-controlled her for a moment. Right? Uh, just softly, and, and then teach her, what's she supposed to teach her? Teach her to like, the word is like, actually, it's phileo, like her husband and children. I'm like, really, you have to, yeah, because it happens even when they were newly married, I guess, I've never been a woman, but I, I think, I can't believe this. I mean, I married my wife, and I thought, of course she's going to like me. I mean, look at me, you know? Uh, newsflash men, your wife does not like you naturally. Just so you know this, she has to be taught to, okay? <laughs> so if you're a young lady in a marriage and you're like, I don't even like him, that's just normal, but you need to go to an older lady so she can show you how to do this, okay? Because you need to like him. It's just not natural, okay, at times because we're not likable. Newsflash kids, you're in the picture too. Um, your parents sometimes want to choke you, but they don't. It's wrong. They don't even like you sometimes until they get trained, 
by older people who show them how to like you. I mean, that's what the verse says. I can't help it, okay? So train them, self-control them when they're upset. Slow them down, older ladies, and help them like their husbands and children. And teach them to be self-controlled. Well, that's twice on the young ladies. Sorry about that, but that's what it says. Teach them to be self-controlled. Teach them to be pure, no manipulators. No immorality, pure. Teach them to guard the home. That's what it means literally is guard the home. It doesn't mean don't work outside the home. It just means that you should be trained as a young lady so that you see the big picture. My wife does. She sees us doing these little things here and says, that's going to turn into this. And I'm like, no, it's not. And I said that for about 15 years. Now I listen. But the last 10 years, I've been listening because she's right. She could see the big picture and she's made by God, having been trained well, to help guard the home and see the whole thing. So men, listen to your help meet. Teach the young ladies to be kind, not snippy, <laughs> submissive to their husbands. And there's a that, so that the word of God may not be reviled. Um, my wife and I, I was a president of American Legion Baseball, and we sat in the stadium over and over. I told a little bit of this at the retreat. But we'd watch the young boys play. It was our way to do outreach, get to know families. And we'd like each other. And people would come every year, multiple times. You two seem like you like each other. And we're like, well, yeah, we're married. And, and they couldn't figure out how. And so we would just give them biblical principles that are why our marriage is happy. And they never went, well, I don't believe that. Never. Because they're watching it in front of them, right? They watch us serve their families with nothing in return. And, uh, and they say, they, they never say, I don't believe that. They go, well, that makes sense, right? The word of God was not reviled by them. As, and I'm giving my wife credit, you notice, because this is in the young lady passage. As she functioned well with me, they could not argue God's word. I need to finish. And it's unfortunate because really the bulk of the message is in the next three or four verses. Because this is where uh, Paul puts you in a knot. Because if you've been listening and you're ready to disregard, you're ready to say, but my life's a wreck, I can't do this, look at I'm a mess of a Christian, da 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 And now he nails you. Like there's no weasel room. Because he says, for the grace of God has appeared. Amen? Uh, excuse me. Uh, the grace of God, has it appeared? I mean, I'm redeemed. Salvation, literally, it means salvation all people. In other words, the grace of God is so big, it could save everyone. That's how stupendous it is, okay? And he says, and this grace of God that brings salvation is training us. So if you're redeemed, in that redemption, you are being trained to renounce undignifiedness or ungodliness and worldly passions non-self-control stuff. And it literally trains us to live self-controlled. How does the gospel do that? Because I sell out to God. Uh, Sam, who just came to know Jesus, at the end of this long text where he declared to us his salvation, because we gave him some scripture, he was on his own, and he texts back. I, I hope my daughter saved it. If she has deleted this, I'm going to self-control her and say, why? Because it was so beautiful. But at the end, he said, and now I must follow the king. You hear that? I mean, that's redemption, isn't it? He knew who his king was. And, and, he, and what is he saying? That's going to teach him self-control. Because now he's like, I got a king. What does the king want? So just in his salvation alone, he knew my life has to be reordered. It's got to be controlled under the king. You see how redemption, if it's real, does this to us? It teaches us to be self-controlled, upright, and godly or dignified lives in this present age, right now. In the ungodly, wicked, tormented, twisted place we live called Mount Pleasant. We can do this. And he says it also, this grace, enables us to wait to take up this blessed hope we have until God returns, right? I mean, we just wait for him because we know this hard place that we've got to help those behind us and reach to those in front of us, we have what we need from God to do this. So I ask you, with this ground in place, are you gonna spit this out? Are you gonna, are you gonna spit this out? Two of us. I gotta re-preach this sermon. I am gonna be, I'll let God preach it to you. So I'll ask you this. So you, right now, what are you gonna do? And I, I, I'm a big believer that you got to make a decision before you leave a service. 
Otherwise, you've ignored God's word. And it may just be, I need to go think about this some more. That's a good decision, as long as you do it. But I will right now. Who's in front of you? Who do you need to go to because you're like, I'm not sure about this or that. I really believe I should go talk to this young person. Good. I should go meet with them, get to know them, begin to help them. So I have a guy in my church that um, came to me. His daughter had come to Christ through our son playing soccer that I coached. And uh, they started coming to church and some of the rest of the family got saved. And he came to me and he had come to Christ, but he came to me. He said, Pastor, I've been waiting to join the church until I get my life cleaned up. He said, I'm hooked on 20 oxy a day and I can't get my way through it. My wife's ready to leave me. I said, okay, Kurt, let's work on this, you know? So we began to walk alongside of Kurt, and he's been clean for four years now. It's really cool uh, to see what God's done, and it was a difficult path. He feels pretty lousy some days still, honestly. And he's helping in our drug and alcohol ministry be a mentor now, and he's growing. And one of the things he did is he replaced his dead time with uh, making duck calls, and And he used it as a way to repair his relationship with his daughter, who was tired of the lying, abusive father. That's what drugs do to you, right? It's it's satanic at its core, the sin that owns us. And uh, so he began to make duck calls. And our son, when he was 10 years old, declared after going to a wedding, poor pastor's kid, that when he got married, he was going to wear blue jeans and a flannel shirt. And when the bride came down the aisle, he was going to blow a duck call. We tried not to laugh because you really shouldn't do that to your children. But I just looked at him and I said, what if she doesn't like that? He said, she will. I like confident child. <laughs> well, he got married. <laughs> and so for his wedding, dad made duck calls. Well, I had Kurt make duck calls out of heartwood because the same color as their wedding, right? And we made duck calls for all the groomsmen. Had it etched on them, the, their name and the wedding date. And I made one for my dad and one for his future father-in-law, and one for myself. And Kurt came to me, and he's making all these for me, and he said, but I'm not making your sons. I'm like, Kurt, he said, you're going to make it. I said, Kurt, I mean, I build cabinets, I do some woodwork, but I do not turn stuff. I mean, this has to, he said, I will disciple you. (laughs) That's not fair pulling that on a pastor. (laughs) I mean, what am I going to do with that word? You know what I mean? He knew what that word meant, and he knew what it meant to me because he had been that guy behind me. And now he was someone that others are coming to, right? And he helped me make a duck call, a prototype, and then one that was pretty decent uh, for my son's wedding. And you can hear the rest of the story some other time. My point is this. It doesn't matter when you come to Christ or what hardship you come out of. God's intention is for you to go to someone who's in front of you and someone who's behind you.